But uh, regardless of all that, this lecture is meant to be an interactive lecture. So whatever examples you want to see, like a report.txt, I can write a, a report.txt also on stream. Uh, this And I intend for this to, to happen. It, I might not always have time, but the Friday, the last Friday of a homework section. Let's see if I can, let me get a little practice. Uh, switching between these things. You can see my debugging tabs up here. So the last Friday, right before a homework's due, I intend to be examples. So anything that you need to help you through homework one, that's what we want to talk about today. I'll show examples that I think will help, uh, but anything you want to see as well. And uh, I guess I didn't stick with that too much, but it, I probably will adjust the schedule to have that happen each uh, each second Friday of each uh, homework block. All right, so let's get into an example. We, we saw this one a little bit on... Um, on Wednesday, I got this <laughs> on Wednesday. So let's look a little bit more at this Python example and talk about how we got this whole thing up and running. And then we're going to switch to JavaScript and Node and get a Node server up and running. And uh, and I'll take uh, suggestions after that. It's uh, it's kind of open ended. Oh, fro frozen gogurt. It, it's running, but I go to the port and nothing shows up. Make sure the common mistake is, I shouldn't even say mistake, but if you have a localhost here, most documentation for your TCP server is going to say to put localhost here. If you put localhost, that means that you're only going to be able to access that app from inside the Docker container. So we change this to 0000. And that's, that's the same as localhost, except it's accessible from anywhere. So instead of just being accessible from inside the container, we're able to access this thing from anywhere, which is what we want. We want to be able to access this from outside of that container uh, because that's where you're mapping the port to. So we're going to have the host, local host, but as zeros, port 8000. I'm going to use threading TCP server to be able to have multi-threading. This is going to be critically important by the time we get to web sockets. So if you already have your server set up as a concurrent server that can handle multiple requests simultaneously, then it, it's uh, it's going to save you time in the long run. With Python, as long as you're running this socket server, socket server, TCP server, if you're running this without threading, that's perfectly fine too. The threading TCP server and TCP server, both those classes take a base request handler as its request handler, as its uh, handler as it receives data. So to change a TCP server, if all your code is set up as TCP server, to change that to multi-threading, you literally just add the word threading there. Use the threading TCP server instead of TCP server. Everything else is the same. It takes a host and a port, takes a base request handler, and everything else works. So let's run this code. Let me get out of Node and into my Python directory. Let's run this and and see what happens when we run it. Python three, and I'm just gonna pray and hope that this works. This is a this is part of the problem where my development environment is my laptop, and then I stream from my desktop, and I don't always have everything set up uh, the way that I want it to. And of course, it doesn't. Oh my God. All right, that is not that big of a deal. I just gotta switch, I just gotta share another window. <clears throat> what, which? doesn't want to show up. Okay, it is going to be a big deal. You're kidding me. This is what I've been facing with all morning. This is 
I'm capturing a window. I can see the window, but it just doesn't show up on stream. Okay, apparently this is a big deal. We, you can't see anything that uh, that I'm doing on this window. Let's try just restarting that and no, just a gray box. Thanks, Windows. Thank you. You have just a few things that have to that Windows has to do, and it just doesn't. All right, so that's not gonna run. Uh, so I'm gonna go for the whole shot here. Uh, let's go back to our code. Uh, I'm gonna go for the whole shot and just run it in a Docker container and just uh, and just uh, have it go like that. So I'm gonna run Docker build uh, dash t to give this image a name. I'm gonna name it Python. Build it from this directory. This dot is very important. This means build from the current directory. That's going to be our path. So when we have our Docker file, when we do this copy dot dot, the first dot is relative to the directory. Oh my God. Oh, successful. Okay, warning. We can live with warnings. We can live with warnings. Um, just use, just use Ubuntu. Um, I, I might, I mean, that's one of my backups. I got tons of backups. We're going to get through this. It's just uh, a matter of how frustrating it is for me and you to watch. Uh, when we copy from this directory, this is relative to the local directory. And when we build, we're specifying the local directory that we're going to build from. So I'm saying build from dot, build from the present current directory, go from that current directory. I'm doing everything from the directory that I'm currently in. We can actually do this. A different way we can do docker build uh, slash Python so I went up one directory I'm in my servers directory and I can say docker build and look for a docker file in the Python directory and then do everything relative to this uh, to that directory uh, but we don't don't really want to mess with that uh, I like doing just everything from one directory Then we're gonna do our docker run dash p for published. You can use the whole command that I, I gave in the slides. I'm going to use a little bit of shorthand, dash p for publish. I'm going to use local port. Uh, I'm just going to make one up 8050 because I'm pretty sure I'm using 8000 right now. Map that to 8000 inside the container. So my app is running on port 8000. So the port inside the container has to be 8000. And then I can choose any local port that I want. So when you look at the, the testing procedures for each objective, the local port is going to be abstracted as local port. That's whatever the grader chooses, whatever port they're running on. It can be any port, but that's the port on their local machine, whoever's running this thing, their local machine. I chose 850 just, just because. No good reason. And then I have to specify the image. I named it Python. And we're going to run that. We shouldn't get any output because I don't print anything when I start my server. But this should be waiting for connections. So if I go to Opera, I should be able to go to localhost because I'm looking at my local port. I'm mapping this locally on my machine. Uh, the port 8050 is going to be reserved by Docker. So my OS is going to say, oh, a request for port 8050, uh, that's that's Docker. So it's going to forward that request. Oh, my God. Yeah, so it's going to forward that request to, uh, to Docker. And it's going to say, hey, I got a request on port 8050. And Docker is going to say, oh, yeah. I'm mapping that port to port 8000 inside this other machine. It's going to connect to that Docker container, which is completely independent of my host machine, my desktop. And it's going to go inside that container and say, hey, I got a request for you on your port 8000. And we should get hello. So we get that, uh, that response from that server. And if we go back to switching windows, I'm in VS Code. Uh, if we go back in this, we should see some good output there, uh, but we don't don't see any output for some reason. Go figure. Uh, is it normal for my website to be working but no output in the command prompt? Well, 
<clears throat> I just uh, I just got that error as well. So um, I did see this in office hours. I don't I haven't seen this on my code yet. Uh, so I'll use the fix that we had in office hours. We did sys dot um, standard out dot flush. And then we have to import sys. I actually don't think this is my my issue here, but I but I still want to try this. Uh, so we're gonna flush the uh, flush standard out to be able to uh, to make sure to force all this text that's waiting to be printed out to send that out to the screen. And let's try to get. I'm just going to refresh a bunch of times to get a bunch of requests. So we are getting buffered. We, we will eventually get this output, but we're getting buffered where all this text is waiting to be printed out, but it's just not printing. So if we flush, that should work. So when I can't get, uh, get out of this, I made an update to my code and I'm using Docker. I have, I'm running Docker to test this. So since I made an update to my code, I'm going to have to rebuild and then run again. And then we're going to get port already used. So I'm going to switch my port, my local port number since 8050. We didn't, uh, we didn't close that down gracefully. So 8050 is still being reserved. So let's switch, switch that to 8051. And hopefully we'll see our output right away. Let me go to the browser and... 8051 and there we get our output so if you add this standard out flush this is going to tell whatever along the pipeline is buffering something you know I, I haven't seen this problem before on my machines on my code but for whatever reason i mean i've been blaming windows all morning so windows is doing something dumb i'll just, I'll just blame windows because why not at this point uh is going to buffer that output and say, I'm not going to, I know you printed stuff out because you want the user to see this stuff, but I'm not going to display any of this to the user until the buffer is full. So whatever size that buffer is, once it's full, that buffer is going to be flushed and then it's going to start rebuffering. So when we say flush, we're going to say, what we're saying is, hey, I don't care about your buffering. Uh, whatever's in the buffer, let the human see that content that I want them to see, let them see it right away. So in Python, import sys and then flush standard out so you can see all of the, the glorious output. Yeah, I could actually can. Let me show that, show that off. Uh, So if I check out my Docker images, I can get my, uh, or sorry, my uh, containers. I can get my container for Python and do Docker stop. Oops. Docker stop that container. And then Docker will sh shut down that container. Just taking a little bit of time. And then when I do Docker PS, that's going to give me a list of all of the running containers and my Python's gone. And if I restart on port 8051, this should not give me the error because I shut it down gracefully. I'm able to reuse that port. But when you control C or force kill anything, that port isn't going to be released uh, the way that we want it to be. But if we do kill it properly, we uh, we will be able to get that image or be able to recover that port right away. Yeah, Docker kill uh, probably also works. I haven't tried that. I haven't used it, but uh, but stop and then uh, uh, whatever whatever you want to stop. Uh, there's also prune, I believe it is. Docker system prune. Uh, so Docker, you're downloading like entire copies of 
uh, of Ubuntu and of, of these different operating systems if you're using something else. Uh, this can get expensive uh, memory-wise. It can start using up a lot of your hard drive. If you want to free up a lot of those as you're developing and creating a whole bunch of containers, Docker System Prune is going to get rid of everything that you're not using. So I can delete a whole bunch of, uh, I just deleted four images. I deleted six containers and I freed up, well, only a couple megabytes of space. So I didn't really save much there, um, but it, it does save uh, some space. And you can do Docker images to check out all your images and see the total space. The reason I didn't save much there is because we can't get rid of Ubuntu or Python because those are being used by other images. So I wasn't able to delete an entire operating system because I'm still using it in my other images. But yeah, they'll get over a gigabyte. My tower's revival here, over a gigabyte to run uh, to run a uh, Scala app. Okay. Let's head over to JavaScript uh, and... Before we, we really get into that, let me get Docker running, because this is going to take a little longer. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, it's just muscle memory at this point. I always hit LS once I get to the directory where, where I want to work. I don't know why I just got in the habit of doing that. Uh, I always hit the LS. So Docker build dash t to name it node i'm going to name this node server uh, i'm surprised i got away with that with python because i have images for python for the the operating system and that uh, so while that's building i want to walk through this this is mostly the uh, so the python one built um built very quickly because i already had it built and docker is very good about caching and uh not redoing work so all i had to do was when i rebuilt was get my newest code into that container. Uh, and I'm not doing much. Uh, I'm not installing dependencies. Uh, in this, normally it would have to reinstall the dependencies, but I didn't have any, so there's nothing left to do. And actually, npm install might break because I don't have a, um, I don't have a package.json file. I don't have any dependencies here. Uh, so we'll delete that and rebuild the container. But since I've never built this container before, it had to download Node and set up that entire environment, uh, which is what it's doing right now. We're from Node 13. This is all downloading that image that needs to be created, which is a combination of multiple images. So while that's downloading, I'll walk through. Oh, otherwise, this is the code from slides uh, from last time, from Wednesday. And there's there's my warnings. Hey, you're trying to npm install, but there's no package.json, because uh, of course. So now I did update that line of the Docker file. I'm gonna rerun Docker, and it goes almost instantly. And of course, it doesn't have those errors because I took out that one line that was causing those issues. Then I'm gonna run this, and we'll talk about the the server here. Docker run dash p uh 80 i don't know 45 whatever 8000 and then node shoot i don't remember what i called it node server and i'm curious if this is even gonna work because i've never ran this code excuse me it didn't it did not And it's the big question of why didn't it? Uh, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through the whole debug process. Maybe after lecture proper. Um, but uh, but I will explain what's going on with this code. So we're gonna start with the net live uh, the net package, which is going to give us TCP functionality in Node. We're going to uh, call create server, which takes a function. If you're not used to JavaScript, there's a lot of call either callbacks or promises. Uh, in this case, I'm using callbacks. Create server is going to take a function, and this function is what's called after the server is created, after the TCP socket server is created. So create server takes one argument or one parameter, and that parameter is a function that's called 
after the server is created. It's a callback. Server is created, and then this function is called with the socket that was created. And each time we have a new socket, uh, each time we get data on that socket, so we're going to say data on, meaning when the data event occurs, so we have event-based architecture here, uh, a callback to 116 if you took the new 116. We have an event-based architecture on this event named data, call this function. So every time we re have data to receive that we can read, we're going to call this callback function, which is going to take that data as a parameter and then run whatever code we want to run when that data is received. So we're receiving this data. I'm just printing it to the screen and then sending back to them with socket.write. I'm sending back our basic hello message, a minimal HT, uh, HTTP response. Uh, let me catch up on chat for a second. I'm kind of, actually, let me. Let me get a console.log here just to I doubt the semicolons are the issue, but let's get them in there to be proper. Build run port and use. Yes. Yes it is. Starting the server. And then nothing. But why? Why nothing? Anybody use a node? Am I missing something obvious? I get tunnel vision when streaming. That's going to be my excuse. Yeah, RAM gets used up a lot with multiple containers. Yeah, not as much as with VMs. With multiple containers, it's not as bad. But yeah, it'll definitely start chewing through your resources once you have multiple containers. Are you sure you want to display a hundred files? Oh yeah, when you hit LS. Yeah, when I'm in a, I, I get that too. When I hit LS by habit and you sure you want to display all this? There's a lot of stuff in here. What's the difference between Docker run and Docker container run? I don't believe there's a difference. Um, the con Putting container is just a more verbose way of saying it. If you do Docker run, it's going to, I believe it implies that you meant Docker container run and just accepts that shorthand. Oh, you can, oh, that's nice to know, Dineski, that you can do the flush flag in Python. That's a lot simpler than, than importing and then calling flush every single time. All right, so why is this server? I'll do, I don't want to go down this road too far. But I do like doing this every once in a while in lecture. I'll go through, start going through my debug process, just so you can see that you know your your professors don't know everything. We we still Google things a lot. There's just way too much stuff to know uh, to be able to uh, know everything, to memorize everything. I gotta look things up every once in a while. The trick is being able to read the documentation. Uh, if you're competent enough to read the documentation. I never, yep, I never created the server. That'll do it. Uh, no, this is different than what I'm doing. Right? What am I doing? No, I created the server right from net. Yeah, they're... This is a different way of uh, of doing it. What's uh, where's the date on this thing? I might have I might have used uh, used an outdated way of doing things. From that, create server on data on end. Don't need that on timeout. Don't need that. Listen does take a callback
It's another thing that drives me nuts. Is this text super blurry? I'm, I'm looking at it through OBS and I can barely read it. Over here on my monitor, it's crystal clear. I've messed around with so many settings and I can't get text to display in a nice crisp way. Uh, it's another another thing I gotta do a deep dive on. I don't want a client. So here, listen is taking a a port and a callback. How do you give it the host when it's set up like that? And where's the official documentation? Hey, there we go. That's that's what I want. Want the server? And that's what I got. And I did, for this stream, I did lower the quality a little bit. I had a lot of complaints Wednesday that the stream was buffering a lot. So I did lower it to 720. But the text, even I jacked up the, that's why I had the jet settings jacked up as high as they could go, is trying to get the text to be more crisp. What resolution is my monitor? I don't, I don't know. Uh, but the, the monitor is not the issue. The monitor displays really nice. It's just when it goes through OBS, something, uh, something that makes the text not good. Uh, so what I always do is just up the size when I'm showing something. I'm not seeing anything that I'm messing up here. So let's just go back to the code and take some stabs at it. Nobody wants to watch me read through documentation. Uh, so what if I turn this into a, uh, host, turn this into an object, host, port, close that thing. We're creating a server. We're giving it the callback. Just in case just in case. Bitrate, yeah, I lowered the bitrate and it, I I jacked up the bitrate to uh I think five thousand or six thousand and that didn't help at all. So for today's lecture I lowered the bitrate to try to get rid of those buffering issues. Yeah, last lecture you didn't have an option to go below 720. Do you have an option now? And do I have to make the server class? I think that's that might be what I'm missing, but... Oh, 45 is still allocated. All right, 44. Okay. So it's because I didn't give a, a dictionary. Maybe that's the new uh, the hot new way of doing it. So I, I went in Opera localhost eighty uh, eighty forty four. We got our hello. For good measure, we can no. I can't do that, can I? I can't. No, I can because it's gonna pop up. But when I right click, you can't see the menu that pops up. But if we go to network, maybe not that big, we can see the uh, the request that was made. All this information, which will match what we've seen in VS Code. We have the same information here. That's the, the exact request. Uh, this guy. So this 
should match exactly what we see in the browser console. This. Same exact thing. And then our response is going to be exactly what we sent back. We sent the headers, these headers, and, and this status line. And the response itself, which is just the text hello. And the, the fav icon, I get this, we get this question a lot. The browser will automatically make this request, even though nothing in our server told it to. It'll ask for the icon that's going to be displayed up here. So, for example, on web apps, oh, man, it's going to get annoying. Inspect element, network, refresh. It's going to be the second time my, my own server is going to mess with me. Well, anyway, there should be a request for this UB logo that's displayed up there, the the fav icon. Oh, I don't, I don't have cache disabled. Just give it to me. Come on. Anyway, while, while we are here, I did look into why this didn't have a content length. If you have transfer encoding chunked, uh, that'll replace the content length. That means, hey, I don't know what the length of the content is yet. But I'm just going to keep sending information using the chunked protocol, which in the body of the response, the first few bytes is going to specify the length of that chunk of data. So the content length is actually in the body when you have chunked data being sent. So you either have transfer encoding and specify what how you're going to encode the data, which includes the length, or you put content length in the headers. We're going to use content type and content length. We're not going to bother with transfer encodings um, in the different encodings in this class. Uh, but you're, so the browser is going to make these fav icons to try to get the icon that's displayed up in this tab. So it's going to make requests. When you see these requests on your server, you, you know, you don't have to, to bother with them. You don't have to handle them. Uh, they should get captured by your 404. Uh, we're getting the 200 okay here because my server doesn't have any logic. I'm just sending back hello no matter what. So I'm getting the 200 because that's what I responded with is the 200. That should be 404. So maybe that's where we'll go now. I want to start talking about... Uh, we saw the setup in two different languages. I want to start talking about uh, what to do once we actually get this data. And, you know, I might accidentally spoil some of the homework here, but, you know, so be it. Um, so let's talk about this. Let me catch up on chat a little bit, which I don't think I missed anything. Just Jesse Lee Hartlaw. Nice username, by the way. Uh, yeah, it wasn't necessarily intended. It's just that's what I'm doing. I'm strictly, I don't care what that is. I don't even read that. I just print it to the screen. I don't parse it at all. I don't do anything. All I'm doing is responding with hello, no matter what the server sends. So, for example, if I go to, uh, if I go to, uh, just something that's not a valid URL because I hit space, it's still going to respond with hello, no matter what that request was, because that's how I s coded my server. It does zero logic. It just responds with hello, no matter what was requested. If I can get to that request. There it is. No matter what was requested, uh, no matter what path was requested, I'm always just responding with hello. So... Let's start doing something a little a little more than this. So the first thing we do when we get a request, and mind you, um, Node is converting my bytes into strings for me. So I get data as a string. 
And when I send, write is going to convert to a string for me. Oh, I'm not going to be able to, to find it. Uh, it's going to convert this string into a byte array for me. So like Python, we always had to make sure we're encoding and decoding. Uh, JavaScript is going to do that part for us. So we have our data as a string. And we can start processing this. Uh, the first thing I like to do is, boy, I haven't, uh, I haven't written in JavaScript in a while, to be honest. So maybe I, I, I want to go to the Python, but uh, I might, if, if I get stuck, I'll, I'll go to the Python. So this is going to be the lines. Uh, this can be const, const lines. And then I want the first line, lines of zero, is going to be the request line. And then I want to split the request line on spaces. Uh, I don't know, parts, request line parts. And let's log those and make sure we're getting what we expect. Parts, const, uh, request type, parts of zero, request path uh, and HTTP version. Let's print these things out. Request line cancel that log request type Request path, HTTP version. And let's re rerun this. And at this point, I would recommend using node, going node server.js. OK, let, never mind. I, I recommend using uh, using node. Uh, I recommend using the, like, if you're building a Python app, just use Python. Uh, if you're building a Node.js app, just use, uh, just use Node. Use whatever language you're using, and then make sure it runs with Docker at the end. After you have all your functionality built, then go to Docker, run your Docker file, build the whole thing. Because it, it's just a little more in your process. If you have to build the, rebuild the Docker image and then run the Docker container every single time you make a change in your code... That gets tedious. It really slows down your workflow. So I do recommend just using the language itself and then um, and building it that way. So we got errors. I'm sure I got something. Uh, is it not that split? Or, uh, and I was thinking this as I was saying it. Like, does that actually... Uh, I think this actually is a, a byte. Uh, a byte array. Uh As I was saying, I'm like, no, that's a byte array. Like, it. Uh, I think the console that log. I think that converts it to a string for me. Uh, so let's quickly uh, node byte array to string. Why is there such a long answer to this? It's that too. I mean, I could have guessed that one, I suppose. Uh, 
Uh, so we do have to convert it to to a string, just with two string. Uh, yeah, I could have guessed two string was the answer to that one. So now we can see the information that we're getting. We get this request. Uh, let me go to the the uh, one for the root path. We get this request for the root path, and we're parsing this request line. We're printing out the request line itself, the request type. We're teasing out these three pieces of information, getting the request type, the request path, and the HTTP version. And at this point, we can start writing our, our logic. We can say, if uh, request type, equals get and request path equals slash then we want to handle this as our root path for root path let's just say uh, can I control K in here no, I can't I don't have a good shortcut so I'm just gonna drag it with the mouse else I'm going to say if I get a request for the root path I'm going to say hello to the user else I'm going to hit him with the 404 not found uh, you got four forward and match our content length one two three six seven eight uh, eleven twelve thirteen fourteen and I want to rerun this node is being good about releasing my port which is good and uh, browser and we can see we got our request for the root path we got hello being responded just like we did before but now our fave icon we're getting the 404 not found we're getting a response you got 404 and we're getting that content length of 14 as we expect and any other path you got 404 Is there a neater way of writing the socket dot right? I mean, yeah. Uh, the socket dot right itself, no. Like that, you have to call that method if, if that's what you mean. I don't think that's what you mean though. Uh, you can. Oops. I guess you can't. In VS Code, isn't going to be nice with that. Uh, at the very least, you can separate this across separate lines. Are we allowed to put you got 404? Yeah, I guess. I mean, if you want to do it just to be funny and, and have a call back to, ref, to lecture, fine. Uh, if you're just cut and pasting my code, you know, you have to understand how to build your own content link. Uh, so you can do it this way. And this is actually what I... What I want to talk about, I, I guess this will be the rest of the time, is uh, how to get your code cleaner. So this is going to end up being if, else if, response, else if, response. You're going to have else if for days in here, just so this isn't an error. Uh, this is what you're, you're going to have this big block of else if in your code if we you keep going down this road and you're going to have all these really gross uh strings that you're building so what i recommend is a few few things here uh to answer your question about getting this neater i like to write a helper method for this function in this case and say uh build response response type or rather mime type as we'll talk about later 
uh, and the content. So these are the two big pieces of information that we need when we're sending something is what type is this? I guess I could have left that at content type. The content type and the say build OK response and the uh, the content itself. You know what? Oops. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and then uh, build this thing out from here. Say uh, let response equal the response line response plus equals and start building this one line at a time content type Let's place in your mime type Since you're going to be doing this stuff for every response, it makes sense to have this in a helper method that does what you need it to do. Uh, and then the content length, this is where we get to leverage some, some good stuff here. The content length, content dot length. Do we think that's going to work? It's a good question for next week. Is that going to work? Uh, let's append our blank line. And finally, the body, the actual content that we want to send. Get this looking a lot nicer. Now we get rid of all of this. Uh, build response, build okay response. And now I just say respond with hello. This is what your web servers are, are doing. If you use a, you know, if you pull in express or something, um, you just say what you want to say. And then inside that server, inside their code, for that library, for that framework that you're using, they're going to do something like this to build the response for you. And we can do the same thing for our 404. Old, not found. Do the same thing here. clean this up a lot uh, build build not found response you got 404 and we got things a lot cleaner uh, but we have one of the big signs that you're doing something wrong or that you could be doing something better in your code is that we have a lot of duplicate code here So when we have that, what do we do? We refactor, we modularize, we uh, we use all the buzzwords. Build response. And we're going to write another method here that factors out all of the common code. Uh, what am I doing? Oh my goodness. I don't I don't want what just happened. I don't even know what button I hit to do this. And we're just getting going. How do I? Just 
stupid. I'm going to close it and restart it because I got in full screen mode and I, I don't know how to. I got in full screen mode and, and got jammed up in that. Okay. So we have our duplicate code. Yeah, exactly. Don't repeat yourself. Uh, we're going to write another method function. I'm used to Scala where everything's a, a method. And we're going to. Paste all this code, except we're going to replace this with the response code. Everything else is identical. And then over here, we're going to return build response 404 not found and forward the mime type forward the content. Two hundred OK. And then we get that code refactored. We're not repeating ourselves anymore. So we're happy with that. And we also don't have to mess around with every single time we want to send a two hundred response. 200 OK and build response. We don't want to do this either because this is just, it's just too much to, I mean, it's not ridiculous, but you don't want to have to type 200 OK every single time. Remember the exact formatting of that. Uh, you just want to say, I want to spend, send an OK response and I want to send hello. Focus only on what you have to when you're calling your methods. Uh, and this will clean that up quite a bit.